Welcome back. Joining me this week on Hard Money is attorney Haley Lennon, partner at Anderson Kill. Haley, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Natalie. Good to see you. It's great to see you. Well, let's start first with the latest on the regulatory front involving the SEC and the CFTC. You mentioned the last time we were both on air together that there is sort of a regulator land grab going on. So what can you share about that? Yeah, I think um, we've seen this for many years, and I think it's finally coming to a head. The SEC has wanted to regulate as much of the cryptocurrency industry as possible. Um, As a reminder to your viewers, the SEC is still relying on case law from 1946, the Howey test, to try to justify what cryptocurrencies are under their jurisdictional control. And so um, it was just, I've lost track of time with all the news we have going on, but a few weeks ago where um, the SEC has done had an enforcement complaint against insider trade it, traders allegedly using um, Coinbase insider information to trade certain cryptocurrencies. And in that, they named nine cryptocurrencies that they have alleged to be securities. Um, what's really weird about that is that there hasn't been, you know, Coinbase hasn't been named, and, but it's sort of like the SEC is trying to slip under the radar some of some of these allegations that cr- these cryptocurrencies are in fact securities and um and i think the biggest complaint in the industry for the general industry is that the sec typically regulates through enforcement action not through some sort of um, clear guidance or cooperative co- cooperative approach to the industry and this also does impact bitcoin and bitcoiners because if you remember the sec is constantly denying things like Bitcoin spot ETFs and even Bitcoin lending and those sort of things. So it's really frustrating. Um, The only other thing I'd add is that we're seeing bills being introduced that will hopefully take some of the regulatory authority away from the SEC and give more of it back to the CFTC, which really is the regulator that should be overseeing commodities and has already made clear that it oversees Bitcoin. Yeah, well, I know a lot of people in the space want less regulation because they're worried the government's going to, you know, first take an inch and then all of a sudden it's going to be a mile. But Haley, I know you've been following the fallout of some of the crypto platforms that went under in recent months, including Celsius. What's the latest on that? And do you think creditors will ever see any of their money? Celsius obviously has filed for bankruptcy protection. They chose to do uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection rather than Chapter 7. And the difference there is that Chapter 11 means that they continue to operate while they work on their financial status. It also means that secured creditors will be paid before unsecured creditors. And we've seen since these um, court filings with the bankruptcy court by Celsius, really pointing to their terms of service and how they intend to treat customers because they did disclose that customers were really turning over ownership and control to the company. And so unfortunately, I think that, um, you know, unsecured creditors have a very long journey ahead of them. I think we might see some lawsuits of individuals trying to um, argue that they should be treated as secured um, secured creditors or in some way have some sort of priority about getting access back to their funds. But all of those things take a very long time. Celsius is due back uh, in court later this month and uh, and you know we'll have some more updates then. Also some surprises as far as companies and government agencies that ended up on that creditor list. Um, All right, let's move on to one of the biggest talking points on Twitter this week, Tornado Cash. I know you wrote an article for Forbes about treasury sanctions. Bring us up to speed on what happened and what it means for the industry. Yeah, it's really wild because I think that the way OFAC has started to introduce their regulations to the crypto space has been very slow and calculated. We first saw, and I believe 2018, let let me, yes, 2018, that when OFAC, you know, really started to add Bitcoin wallet addresses to their sanctions list. So what OFAC, you know, their job is to maintain the SDN list, which contains names, entities, and even vessels, shipping vessels that are associated with terrorist um, activity. And and, and that's a very serious, um, you know, oversight. It's OFAC is strict liability. So there's no de minimis exception or amount. Uh, there's no intent or knowledge requirement to be found liable for that. And so, you know, back in 2018, when, when they started to add wallet addresses to the SDN list, 
it, it made sense because the wallet addresses were directly connected and associated with individuals that were also being added to the SDN list. Um, earlier this year, we saw another example of another mixer being added to the SDN list and some associated wallets. But again, that was a bit different because those wallet addresses added to the SDN list were directly associated with some entities that were tied to terrorist organizations. Um, in the case of Tornado Cash, I think the biggest concern here is that they not only the SDN list has now been updated with Tornado Cash, which, by the way, is not really an official entity. It's more of a open source software and non custodial mixer, meaning that anyone who sort of touches that software could have issues with OFAC. And like I said, OFAC is a very big, very real regulator to be concerned with. And so I also saw a report today from Chainalysis that I think only about 10% um, of the funds that are actually associated with Tornado Cash were in fact connected to these hacking incidents. And so we have this big question mark on whether OFAC and other regulators really understand the consequences of some of the news that's come out this week. I know there's many organizations, including Coin Center, that are working really hard on solutions and edu continued education to regulators. Um, but it does, it leaves a big question mark for the industry and privacy technology um, and really software and how, how you know, the industry can continue to grow when, when regulators in the U.S. Approach, approach aspects of the technology like this. Yeah, no, you're right. So many questions and in large part because many of the people involved in this space are international. So difficult for U.S. regulators to keep track of that. Um, you know, I just want to ask before we close out, what is the hardest part about practicing crypto law in the U.S.? Such a new space emerging. You mentioned laws from 1940s. Yeah, I think I think you kind of nailed it. I mean, keeping track of everything. There's never there hasn't been a dull uh, moment or dull week in the industry since I really started uh, working in the space in 2013, 2014. Um, also yeah, understanding how these old old laws should apply to the new technology and the educational component. Um, a lot of interacting with regulators and trying to make sure that regulation, as much as we don't want it, the regulation that's here is informed and, um, and created in a way that doesn't just stifle the innovation of this technology and and the goals we all have for Bitcoin. Um, you know, it's 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 a hard job, but but I love it and happy to come on and, and share all this news with 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 you today. We hope you enjoyed that interview. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you don't miss out on any hard money content.